and we promised it earlier, we've delivered now. Rick Hunt, general manager of the Chicago White Sox, stepping by and joining us here. What's up, Rick? Not too much, Connor. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you stopping by. Uh, I know we're going to step through some of the things that you've talked to earlier this afternoon, and we'll you know, talk about other stuff. I, I know I've already prepped you with this. Willie Harris was in that seat not 25, 30 minutes ago, and he laid down a freestyle rap. He stole my thunder. I know. I, you can't have two on the same show do that, I, so I'm going to pass. I just feel terrible because you stepped up here with the verse that you were going to lie down. Ready. I was and ready you, to bust a rhyme for you here. I'm, I apologize. Shocking White Sox nation. We're going oh, well. to get some of the show set up. You and I, we're going to figure this thing out. A little, uh, we'll put the bed down and make it work. How has the, you know, the offseason has certain expectations to it, regardless of when you step into it. Um, and I think, you know, by and large, this was a, a White Sox offseason that, Quite frankly, I don't know that a lot of people saw you making moves the way you made moves, and I, I mean that by trading some of the young kids in this system, um, given the way that the free agent market looked at, I looked like rather. Uh, I wonder the process heading into this thing before we even started with trades. Yeah, you know, we. Anytime you have a season where you've underachieved and and you didn't meet your expectations, you need to take stock of everything in terms of where you sit, and that process really began in August as we took a look at where we were from a performance standpoint, where we were from a scouting standpoint, coaching, uh, front office decision making, and, and where we were as a farm system and where we ranked within the division. And ultimately we made the decision that we're blessed with some pretty special players entering the prime to their careers, whether it's Chris Sale he just had here, or Jose Abreu, and Eaton, and, and Quintana, and Rodon, etc. This thought was we are closer to being able to get to where we want to be if we add than if we tore the thing all the way back down. Sure. We've obviously seen very artfully done rebuilds in recent years, whether it's over on the north side or in Houston or Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Washington. Sure. But the fact of the matter is, is even the most well executed of those takes every bit of five years of being under 500 to get yourself in position to contend. You know, shoot, Pittsburgh's in a wonderful position now. They were under 500 for 20 years. No kidding. Uh, our belief was, we have the goal in mind if we want to win multiple championships. What's the most expeditious way, most prudent way to get there? Obviously, as we sat here a year ago at this time, there's a lot of optimism about this club. And not just from the people at SoxFest or in the front office or the players, but you know, in objective media, guys like Joe Sheehan predicting us to win 92 win games last year, and then Ken Rosenthal picking us to win the World Series. Obviously, we didn't fulfill that potential, but as we sit here now with the additions we made with Frazier, Laurie, and at the catching position, we feel we addressed three important needs on the offensive side of things. And a lot of the players about whom there was optimism are still on the roster and still have the ability to perform at the upper level of their performance ranges as opposed to towards the bottom. I want to talk a little bit about that catching situation. We had Alex on the show really to start things off. The dude sits down, and you can just tell he thinks the game kind of morning, noon, and night. And, you know, he's from a baseball family, which we talked about mm -hmm. a little with Willie Harris. Um, talk about the, the courtship of, of Alex Avila a little bit, will you? I mean, and, and how kind of things broke down to get, you know, that guy in that position. You know, obviously we've played against Alex for a long time and, and, and been admirer of his, of his ability. Uh, he did have some injury issues the last couple of years. He had a concussion a couple of years back, and then last year the knee acted up on him a few times, and he wasn't able to get out there as much. So when you talk about the Alex Avila of a few years ago, and you're like, boy, you got yourself a silver slugger, all-star catcher from the left side. That looked pretty nice in our ballpark. Then you got to investigate where that guy go and what happened. Are the physical issues something that are behind him, or are they going to be lingering things? Once we got comfortable with where we were on the medical side in terms of where we think he's going to head, uh, it was a matter of explaining to Alex how we saw the role. Now, we also brought in Diner Navarro for a reason, right. another switch hitting catcher, uh, who we feel is going to help the two of them combined, is going to give us a pretty potent offensive combination behind the plate. Now, obviously, I spent a lot of time over the last few years defending Tyler Flowers in terms of what he brought in. Tyler was a very fine pitch framer, and, and guys like Chris Sale and Q had a lot of success throwing to him. Right. So we wanted to make sure in making a change at that position that we weren't forsaking important things to our pitching, our pitching staff's success. Uh, in talking to people, not just our scouts, but people who, who had pitched to these guys, both of whom have caught Cy Young Award winners before, Navarro and, and Avila, to a man, people raved about their receiving skills. Now, they don't necessarily show up quite as strongly on the framing metrics as Tyler did, but in terms of blocking, pitch, pitch uh, throwing out runners, and pitch calling, they're very, very strong. We feel like the, the net of the entire 
the, the entire addition is a positive and then certainly helps us from an offensive standpoint, which as I, as I preface this whole conversation was, uh, with was a priority in terms of upgrading this year. Talking with General Manager Rick Hahn here on White Sox Weekly, live from SoxFest 2016. Got a couple of minutes more. Um, your acquisition of Brett Laurie was, I, I thought, an interesting one because first and foremost, you know, you pick him up and everybody's going, oh, there's your White Sox everyday third baseman. And then you go out and sign, or trade for rather Todd Frazier and go, oh, there's your everyday White Sox third baseman. Um, your, the pursuit of Laurie I thought was interesting. He's a guy who... If you look at his first 100 and what 50, you know this better than I. 150 plate appearances. You compare those to Mike Trout's. Yeah. Brett Lurie's was better. Yeah. Better. <laughs> what was you know what was the the what was the target looking like when you were shopping for things like things that look like Brett Lurie? Well, it's funny actually. The day we acquired Brett that morning, I woke up and I thought we were actually in the position to acquire both Brett and Todd that same day. Really? Yeah. And. and the Frazier deal obviously fell, that iteration of it fell apart, and it took another, I don't know, week, 10 days, however long it took to get it back together. Uh, but we always would. ask you if that was a multi team deal that fell it apart? Was. It okay. was. It right. uh, was. We, we, I had worn out Walt Jockety and, and ah. Dick Williams for long enough that at that point I knew the only way that was going to work was through a third party. It's a favor you were doing for them. Exactly, doing exactly. I was helping them out by leaving them alone uh, and finding a different route. But no, we, we thought that morning we were going to be able to consummate trades for both those players the sure. same day. Uh, when it became apparent that the Frazier one was not dead, but probably on life support and at least needed to be revisited, we still wanted to go ahead and get Brett because, as you said, he could play third base for right. us. Uh, the goal was still to acquire Todd, move Brett over to second, if, but if we didn't, at least we had a third baseman. Third base has been a uh, obviously a difficult position for us, going back to Joe Creedy or possibly, possibly even Robin, uh, in terms of finding solutions. It's just not an extremely strong position in the game, you're better off growing it than trying to go out and acquire it. Right. Uh, so when we went into this offseason, it was a position of need yet again, as it had been for the last few years. We wanted to find somebody who was going to bring a uh, solid defensive play and ideally a little bit of pop in his bat to, to help boost up our numbers in, in the middle of the order. Uh, Frazier was the number one target. Lori was not too far behind him in terms of guys that we felt still young at age 26, still had the chance conceivably to hit 20 in our ballpark and brought some sort of energy and positive makeup to the lineup. I'm looking around, you know, kind of at, uh, at what's left for this ball club. I mean, there's still off-season left. There's still players out there. I think, um, just an aside here, I think the qualifying offer is a ridiculous thing and probably has to go away. There's good ball players that don't have jobs. I, I sat down and saw Howie Kendrick had signed with the Dodgers, and congrats to him, but they... they I'm trying to think of the phrase that I can use on radio about what they did to Howie <laughs> Kendrick there. Uh, but it, it's not a great system, and it needs to change. So I, I wonder if there are there steps left for the White Sox, or the things that you're looking at doing yet still, and, and is there a possibility that maybe you know, they, they grab a headline or two here yeah, in the look, next uh, my, Our mindset is the same as it's been since I spoke after the Frazier deal, and that is we feel we still can upgrade this lineup, sure. or even the pitching staff conceivably. There are still upgrades that we can make to this club. Uh, obviously, it was fairly well published at least on Twitter, our pursuits of various upgrades over the last several weeks. Uh, those didn't pan out, but the fact of the matter is, is we're going to continue to swing big and look for high-impact guys that we can bring in here. For whatever reason, certain segments of this market, not just because of the qualifying offer you referenced, but just even positionally, have yeah. been a little slow to evolve from uh, both a trade and a free agent standpoint. The catcher market moved real fast. The, some of the pitching market moves real fast, but the outfielder market, for example, took a little while longer. Uh, you know, we sat at the winter meetings and there was a little bit of frustration because we didn't do any trades just yet. And I explained, I'm like, look, I didn't use Todd Frazier's name, but it was referencing Todd. And it, it doesn't matter if we acquire a guy while we're here in Nashville or we acquire him next week. We just need this guy by opening day. Trade deadlines, or excuse me, the, the winter meetings are an artificial deadline. Yeah. Soxfest is an artificial deadline. Yes, last year was a little perhaps easier for me because most of the work was done and people looked at it and they were pleased with it. At this point, it is conceivable, yes, we go to opening day, which is the real deadline, right. with the group we have together. But it's certainly not how we're approaching our work over the last several weeks or nor how we'll approach and right up through opening day. I still think there's a chance to improve. Rick, appreciate you sitting down. Thanks so much. We'll get you on a White Sox Weekly again soon. And just, you know, email me. Let me know what karaoke song you want to do. We'll get things set up. It's all good. Sounds good, Connor. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Rick Hunt, general manager of the White Sox, stepping in on WLS AM 890.